on the island of Puerto Rico for this year's first installment of Boxing After Dark. Tonight, undefeated sensation Miguel Cotto continues his march toward a possible world title shot and matchups with the division's elite as he faces Demarcus Corley in a 140-pound junior welterweight fight scheduled for 12 rounds. Following in the footsteps of great champions like Felix Trinidad, Federican native Miguel Cotto is hyped as the sport's next great superstar. But before he can call out the big guns of his division, the likes of Costa Zou, Arturo Gatti, Floyd Mayweather, Vivian Harris, and welterweight champion Zab Judah, he must get by Demarcus Corley tonight. A durable opponent who went the distance with both Mayweather and Judah within the last 19 months, he's never been knocked out. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley. We welcome you to Bayamon, Puerto Rico for a showcase for the young man who's regarded as one of the two hottest young prospects in boxing. Last week, you saw middleweight prodigy Jermaine Taylor stating his case for a possible title shot against Bernard Hopkins down the road. Tonight, Miguel Cotto tries to state a similar case for upward mobility in the most talent-rich weight class in boxing, the 140-pound division. Here to work with me, as always, HBO boxing analyst Larry Merchant. Larry, conventional wisdom in boxing now is that Cotto is a threat to anyone in the 140-pound weight class, up to and including the great champion, Costa Zou. The question becomes, How's he going to make upward progress when nobody really wants to fight him? The same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice, practice, practice. Fight, fight, fight. Cotto needs to fight until he can translate this big, passionate crowd to the U.S. and become the kind of attraction nobody can afford to avoid. An impressive performance here tonight can speed along the process just as it did for the other prodigy, Jermaine Taylor, last week. And the opportunity is here because Curley's credentials as a kind of gatekeeper include a split decision loss to Zab Judah, the current welterweight champion, and a route-going defeat by the virtuoso Floyd Mayweather Jr. And after this fight, comparisons will be made. And you mentioned the raucous and adoring crowd. We've got more than 10,000 people in this 10,000 seat arena and the overwhelming majority of them have been here about three hours waiting to shower their love on Cotto. Meanwhile, also here to call the fight with us, of course, boxing after dark expert commentator, the legendary trainer and manager, Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, also the manager, incidentally, of one of those 140 pound stars I mentioned, Vivian Harris. But when we talk about Miguel Cotto, Emmanuel, talking about a young man who admits he's having great difficulty making 140 pounds, and just wait until you see, incidentally, the unofficial weight at which he will truly enter the ring tonight and the advantage that he'll have over Corley. Is he ultimately going to be a welterweight, or does he want to keep the enormous advantage he gets by managing to make weight 27 hours before the fight and then ballooning in this weight class? Well, Jim, I don't think he's going to have a choice. I think Mother Nature is going to take his natural course, and he definitely will be a welterweight. As a matter of fact, if he wasn't fighting as often as he's been, which is almost like every 90 days, I think he would not be able to make the junior welterweight right now. But I think he could work very effectively in the welterweight division. If Dwight Quarry, who was only 5 feet 7, could work effectively and win the light heavyweight championship and cruiserweight, I think that he could move up and he would be a serious threat as a welterweight. Yeah, Goto's only 5'8", but height is the least of his problems at this moment because he's proven himself in so many categories as both a technician and as a physical specimen. Now let's take a look at that number I told you about as you look at the tail of the tape for Miguel Cotto against Demarcus Corley, and you can see that unofficially, having weighed in yesterday at 140, Cotto would enter the ring tonight at 157 pounds with a 17-pound weight advantage over Corley, who weighed in at 137 and has rehydrated only up to the division limit of 140. Cotto's six years younger. He's one inch taller. He gives away one inch in arm length from the armpit to the end of the fist. He apparently, unofficially, outweighs his opponent by 17 pounds, more than 10% of his body weight. Here are the rules about with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The Miguel Cotto, the Marcus Corley fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the unified rules that you see in your screen. Jim, real quick, the four criteria that the judges will use to score each individual round, clean punching, effective aggressiveness, ring generalship, and defense with a strong emphasis on clean, effective punching. Jim. All right, 
Thank you very much, Harold Letterman. And there is DeMarcus Corley, who is wearing an unusual piece of headgear into the ring. Which he designed himself. He designs all of his outfits. Took up sewing in high school. Famous for shopping uh, and lingerie shop for himself. But he's come into this hostile arena as a hostile opponent. Last year, Corley feels as though he missed the chance of a lifetime when Emmanuel Stewart, in his fight in Atlantic City with Floyd Mayweather, he caught Mayweather in the fourth round and for the moment had him on Queer Street. Yeah, I was kind of surprised because I've been knowing and watching Floyd Jr. ever since he was a six-year-old and I saw him seriously hurt. But afterwards, DeMarcus said that he had a blown, uh, blood deficit uh, iron or something and that's what prevented him from finishing off Floyd. Yeah, that's right. He said he had iron poor blood. And uh, even though he doesn't get to have a Geritol endorsement deal, he does say that he's been taking iron supplements to prepare him to fight better tonight. I think he was just as surprised as Mayweather was, and that's why he didn't take, try to take him out. Ultimately, Mayweather pounded out an easy, unanimous decision over Corley, but Corley went the distance there, just has been the case in all of his losses, you can see that he beat Randall Bailey on a unanimous decision, just as Miguel Cotto knocked out Randall Bailey in six rounds in his last outing. Looks it. And now as Corley waits there in that bizarre headgear, and I gotta tell you, Emmanuel, if I were his trainer, I think I'd want him to breathe rather than to be wearing that. Well, I'll I tell you what, I admire for having the nerves to come here. That means he is confident regardless of what the outcome is going to be. He's coming in on a confident level. Well, maybe he's a, a fan of science fiction. And uh, it might be science fiction for him to beat Cotto in his hometown. Perhaps Cotto had decided that Corley should keep that headgear on as long as possible. <laughs> you know, and the fact that Corley was saying that he expects to win a unanimous decision down here. With this crowd tonight the way it is, which is much like it was in Detroit when Thomas Sands fought for Peter Quavis, this is a knockout crowd tonight. A lot of excitement and drama in there. They are here to watch Miguel Cotto try to do what no one else has done, and they're here to cheer him too. of the reception, you might think that Felix Trinidad, Wilfred Benitez, and Wilfredo Gomez were all coming into the ring together. Jim, what, it, what impressed me about this crowd was how many of the fans are young fans. And it's almost as if they're making their statement, Toto is our generation's guy. There's not an empty seat in the house. There is not a, a throat in the house with which, which isn't cheering right now other than our own. And now let's go to Michael Buffer for the official introductions. Damas y caballeros, buenas noches y bienvenidos al Coliseo. Ruben Rodriguez aquí en Bayamón, Puerto Rico. Top Rank Incorporated and Asociación con PR Best Boxing in Nemera presentan dos asaltos por el título mundial junior welter de la OMB. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBO Junior Welterweight Championship of the World. Presidente de OMB, Francisco Paco Barcarcel, sancionado por la Comisión de Boxeo de Puerto Rico, Presidente José Peña Garicano, y el honorable alcalde de Bayamón, Ramón Luis Rivera. The three judges at ringside scoring this bout, los tres jueces, Michael Pernick, Cesar Ramos, y Stuart Winston. 
and the referee in charge, El Arbitro Enrique Quinones Valu. And now for the thousands in attendance and the millions around the world. Bayamon, están listos. Borricuas, están listos. Damas y caballeros, uh, let's get it. Primero, en la esquina azul, con pantalones azul, con un peso de 137 libras. In the blue corner, weighing 137 pounds. Record profesional, 29 victorias, con 16 knockouts, 3 derrotas y un empate. 28 victories, 16 knockouts, 3 defeats and 1 draw. From Washington, D.C., el retador, the challenger. Former WBO Junior Welterweight World Champion, El Ex Campeón Mundial, De Marcus. Up top, Coley. Two time, baby, two time. Y la esquina roja, con pantalones negro y plateado. Un beso de 140 libras in the red corner, weighing 140 pounds. Con un profesional record perfecto. 22 peleas, 22 victorias. Con 18 knockouts, a perfect record, 22 bouts, 22 victories, including 18 knockouts. Damas y caballeros de Jaguas, Puerto Rico, the reigning. Defending, undefeated, WBO Junior Welterweight Champion of the World, El Invicto Gran Campeón Puerto Riqueño, Miguel Otto. Nada de globo. Está claro en la regla. Está claro. Hey, any mink, man. Any problem in question of the ruling? No? Okay, okay, it's not too good. Any problem. Okay. Given the tremendous weight advantage Cotto has coming into this fight, it would be a disappointment, Jim, if he didn't make an impression in this fight. You know, actually, if he was fighting as a welterweight, we would be looking at the same body that we're looking at tonight. In the old days, if he was fighting as a middleweight, you'd be looking at that <laughs> same body. Yeah, you're going to you have a really actually almost a lightweight and a middleweight for the most part. Cotto's last two knockouts have come on right hands, even though his massive left hook is his trademark punch. Corley, the southpaw, was jawing at Cotto during pre-fight introductions and basically saying, you ain't nothing. Now we'll see what Cotto is for real as he hammers the Corley right on the chin with the right hand. And down goes Corley off the left hook. I don't believe that Corley is hurt. It was a flash knockdown. I, I agree with you, Larry. It was, it's, a lot of it is a strength. You can see the tremendous strength difference there. Yeah, and you can sense that Cotto senses the strength difference. Yes. Well, you can also see that Cotto has worked hard on throwing straight right hands, and his right hand lead is working perfectly. And now Corley comes back with a left hand lead, a right hook. They trade shots, and Corley goes to his knees again. Not 
ruled a knockdown. That was ruled a slip. And at this point, both guys are showing very powerful, short, accurate punches. The difference seems to be simply the weight difference. And Marcus Corley's never been knocked out. Miguel Cotto's trying to get it done in the first round as he puts Corley all the way through the rope. They've still got a minute and a half to go in the round. They could have called that a knockdown when Corley went through the ropes. Out the hook. And, and, and Cotto is fighting the perfect fight right now. He's very physical, very busy. And Corley not boxing like he said he was going to do. And momentarily looked desperate there as he came out of the corner and tried to throw a big shot. Now, if Corley can land five punches in a row and get hit with one punch back by Cotto, he's going to be hurt because of the difference in the strength. There's a red mark under the left eye of Corley. Maybe it's already a small trickle of blood. Another hammering body shot from Corley, or I should say from Cotto, and Corley grabs and holds. Another right hand lands for Cotto. He's been tremendously efficient with the right hand here in the first round. Well, he said the reason that he wasn't so effective a while back and it with his right hand was because that was a shoulder that he got hurt in that car accident. And gradually he began to get more and more strength back in it. Some fighters have difficulty landing their left hook against a southpaw. Cotto has had no trouble so far. Well, Cotto's punching everything perfect, short, accurate. And I give Corley credit. He's not backing off. He's, he's not boxing, but still he's not trying to clinch and just survive, neither. But he's also going through one of the most punishing rounds of his entire career uh -oh. as a hammering uh -oh. puncher uh -oh. Uh -oh. has tested him with both hands in this uh -oh. round. And when we go to Miguel Cotto's corner where they speak Spanish, our interpreter is Jerry Omaya, and Cotto doesn't like Corley, and vice versa. Well, this is what happens when you get a crowd like this. This is the crowd that's doing this, not the fighters. Very deeply. He's yours, man. He's yours. Don't worry. Stay in control. He's got him. You've got him. You okay? The knockdown was a left hook that was kind of a club and punch, and I think just the fact that he was so physically much stronger in the balance position created the knockdown. So legitimately, it was a knockdown, but I don't think that Corley was hurt that much when he arose from the knockdown. Now, as you both observed, both you and Larry, just the difference in strength. Cotto's able to move Corley when he wants. Copy box numbers on round one, Cotto 28 out of 73, including 27 of 68 power shots. You know, Corley came in extremely light at 37, suggesting that he wanted to show a little bit more movement in boxing, but he's not really doing that. And maybe it's because Cotto won't let him. <laughs> Cotto shortening the distance constantly, keeping pressure on Corley, going oh, back to the body over Cotto, and Cotto. over again. Okay, that's where they made. Cotto fights much like most of the great fighters from Puerto Rico in the recent years, you know, keeping his hands up very high, short, after pinpoint punches. But maybe one of the better punches of the guys, when you look back at Gomez and Rosario and Tito and Benitez, Cotto is totally willing to trade with Corley. He's tasted Corley's power and believes he has too much of his own. That's going to be ruled a low blow, but it was a vicious shot. Well, anything that Cotto lands is going to hurt, whether it's legal or illegal. And it looks as though the referee is taking a point away, even though there had been no prior warning. About doing that. Now, who is he taking the point from? Wait a minute. Where is he? It appeared that he was taking a point from Cotto for the low blow. But he didn't make it very clear. He, but normally, you're supposed to point to the boxer who the point is being deducted from and then notify each one of the judges. Well, it's obvious he's being given five minutes to recover here and is taking a fair amount of it. That's intelligent. But now here they go again. Still short of the halfway mark in round two. Oh. 
Right hand to the body again by Cotto, twice. Left hook upstairs and a left hook to the body. Tried to bring the right hand across, Corley ducked it. That was a good right, right counter hook by Corley also. Corley with the one, two, slightly short with the left cross. Cotto's taking some risks. Corley's gonna get some shots at Cotto's chin. Yeah, All ready to pop him a couple times. Oh, now, very hard left, left got, by got Corley. Got As we told you, Corley would get some shots at Cotto's chin. That was a big left cross, and Cotto seemed to walk right through it. There's another big left cross by Corley. Both landing. I'm impressed with Carly. With I never expected him to punch with this type of an authority that he's punching with. And, and he's actually landing blows. Maybe he's hit Cotto more than I've saw anyone else hit him. I think in part, Emmanuel, that's because Cotto has been a little bit more reckless than we usually see him because of his weight advantage. Yes, and he knows that he, he can take those blows and probably that's still survive. I totally agree. What I also think Cotto may be taking a couple of extra chances to try to give himself the chance for the impressive knockout of a fighter who's never before been finished. And Corley tasted two more hard body shots there. And you can see the difference in the strength and they're just in close and you can see Cotto just pulled him down. Okay. So that concludes round two in which once again apparently a point was taken from Miguel Cotto for hitting low. Like a bull, stay down on your left uppercut and pull the hook. It's gonna work, y'all. You gotta believe in it, champ. All right. Believe in it. Keep, keep using the jam, all right? Let him come into it. Keep jam when you can walk into the left uppercut and pull the hook, champ. Be okay, champ. Let it work. Let it work. Keep it going, all right? Okay. Don't be up on you when you pull the hook, all right? Stay down on it. The low blow that you see right there that came from Cotto, that's the type that was just above the hip bone, which a lot of times can help paralyze you and, and restrict your movements later on. Great left hand came back right there by Carlin. He's landing a lot of clean punches tonight, and if he was about 10 pounds heavier, I think Cotto may would be in trouble. Double left hook, landing to the body again there. Right to the body, and that backs Corley off again. Corley with a hard left to the body himself. Cotto partially blocked it with his elbow. That one, right on the flexes. He punch. Corley has hurt Cotto. Miguel Cotto's in trouble and is holding on. He's in serious, right. serious he almost trouble. went down on that punch. Right, he never saw the punch. And he's still staggering serious. and still in trouble. Corley's got a chance here for a knockout if he can get at Cotto. Cotto still staggered. Two minutes left in this round. And Corley goes twice to the body and Cotto still bobbled. Tremendous opportunity for Demarcus Corley to score an upset of the young prospect. Cotto landed right. low again. Referee didn't see it. Well, we've Corley never had to. Corley's got a great opportunity. He should not be going to the body. He should be going to the head. Great left hook counter by Cotto. Back Corley off. And the shot that he hurt, He's Cotto with the right hook. You see, to keep trying that more. Throw a slow left hand and come back with a hard right hook. And Cotto, for the moment, seems to have his legs back. With a minute and a half still to go in the round. Well, we've Let's never the right seen... hook again. And the right hook is hard doing the damage. shot by Corley. We've never seen Cotto have to deal with adversity. This is a major test of what he is made of. But I don't see why. Well. Corley seems to feel as though the way to finish Cotto is to go to the body. Yeah, he's trying to come up between the gloves. Cotto is letting Corley swarm him and looking for chances to counter. Hard right hand lands for Corley after Cotto's combination landed. Miguel keeps backing up because he's still foggy. He's still foggy, which is very smart, though. Cotto has been vulnerable to that right hook over his left. And, and you know, if Carly would shoot a power shot up through the middle, I think he would do a lot of damage now, too. Miguel Cotto was almost out on his feet. 
but for the moment has survived the most severe test of his 23 fight career. And you still got to watch for that right hook. Every time he throws his right hand, he's leaving himself open to get caught with a right hook. Straight left hand lands for Corley. Cotto backs into the ropes again. Corley swings and misses with the right hand. Cotto seems to have his faculties back. The right hook again. And it'll be fascinating to see what Evangelista Cotto says to his nephew between rounds. I made that a two point round for Corley. You've got to let go of the hook, man. Wait, breathe. Wait, nothing happened, nothing happened. Now it's our turn. It's our turn, you understand? Look at all those people. Get down to work intelligently. Come on, don't lose your head. Right here, you see Cotto getting caught with one of the best trick punches of the other that a southpaw catches, a right hand whip, is the right hook when he's throwing his straight right hand himself. And hit him around. And it, and it seems like his mind is so preoccupied and looking out for the straight left coming from Corley that he's not watching Corley's right hand. So that was the counter right hook that did such a tremendous amount of damage to Miguel Cotto in that round. Power shots in three. Corley landed 20 out of 46. Not enough, however, to get Cotto to the canvas. Harold, how do you have it through three? Okay, Jim, the scoring in this fight is very interesting. Round one, 10-8, Miguel Cotto because of the knockdown. Round two, 9-9. Nine, nine. Cotto went around 10-9 uh, and had a point deducted for the low blow, becomes 9-9. Nine, nine. Round three, definitely, as Larry said, 10-8 Corley, he had him out. 27-27, all even. Corley lands another hard right hook. This one, Cotto takes reasonably well. But uh, Cotto has not backed off and went too defensive this round. He's coming right back and trying to resume the same tempo that he was at in the earlier rounds. But he's not throwing as many double left hooks, and he's holding his yeah. hands a little higher. Yeah, he's throwing more of a right hook more instead now. Again, Corley cracks Cotto on the air with the right cross. Cotto has a swelling on the bridge of his nose now. And his left eye is beginning to close just a tiny bit. So Demarcus Corley has made a physical impact in the fight, despite apparently being outweighed 17 pounds. Corley is very, very much impressing me tonight. I, I never expected this type of a fight from him. I said earlier it would be science fiction for Corley to win, but it's science non-fiction, real professionalism oh, right, so that's okay. keeping... Oh, one, four, it's just low four, blow four, lands for four, Corley four, right on Cotto's cover. Four, and if he deducted four, one point from Cotto, then yes, he's going to deduct a point from Corley as well. But in the way he's doing it is almost like he's deducting a point from Cotto, even though we know what's going on. And Cotto's not taking anywhere near the amount of time that's available to him, despite seemingly having been rocked by the low blow. I, I'm not sure, but I, I thought, maybe I'm wrong, that it was a time when he was throwing the body shot, and seemingly Cotto pulled his head, which happens often, accidentally, and that's why the punch went lower than the intended target area. Yeah, when I said vicious, I was talking more about the effect than the intent. Strong combination by Cotto. Rocks Corley one more time against the ropes. Corley comes back and hits Cotto right on the button with a straight left. Corley is finding holes in Cotto. Cotto got in one more good shot just below the belt line at the end of the round. That was definitely a low blow. 
And an just, intentional just, low blow. Just, if you look back. Yeah, just enough to, to really hurt. He got up underneath the cup. Wasn't being pulled down. No, he fired the shot right down. at the cup. No, his head was down, but he wasn't being pulled down. Keep your hands up. You bring your left hand down. Keep it up. We've got excitement in Bayamon, Puerto Rico in Boxing After Dark as Demarcus Corley and Miguel Cotto move into the fifth round of what has been a seesaw battle so far. Both men at different times seemingly on the verge of knocking their opponent out in this fight. Power shots through four. Cotto 85 out of 209. Corley 60 out of 162. And you can see that Harold Letterman gave the last round to Cotto and made it a 10-8 round because of the deduction of a point from Demarcus Corley. Cotto's pace slows now yeah, much, in round five. Much more deliberate after he was walking into too much heavy fire. And this pace is far more analogous to the pace at which Cotto has fought most of his previous fights. He's generally way more careful than was the case in rounds one, two, and three here. Yeah, I think, as we said earlier, because he felt he's such a great physical advantage in terms of weight and strength. But still, I thought the stoppage was too quick. I thought it should have been. I agree. I, 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 think I, I generally agree with Larry that I, Corley had shown yeah. enough professionalism to get at least one more chance. Yeah. However, I think the issue had been decided too. Yes, I think already. I, I agree. I agree. But you got to give a pro like that a chance to recover between rounds and see what he comes up with, just as we saw what Cotto came up with after he was damaged. Bombs away in this fight. CompuBox numbers of their 190 total connects in the fight between these two fighters. Only 10 of them were jabs. It was a power punching trade shot exhibition. I was very surprised. I never expected it to be this type of explosive fight, but 
the crowd itself, I don't think, would permit it to have been anything else than what it was tonight. And a good moment of sportsmanship there for two guys who fought savagely after the end of the bell in round two. And I was impressed with both fighters tonight. I mean, anybody can get hurt, and it does happen. And I was impressed at how Cotto regrouped, uh, took his time, and fought himself back into the fight. And I was overly impressed with Carly with the punching power that he showed and the courage tonight. All right, here's another look at the last knockdown. Two replays, Emmanuel, and well, increasingly throughout the fight with that 17-pound weight advantage as Cotto continually steered Corley toward the ropes, his advantage mounted. Yes, and you can see we're just going to be a matter of time. So this is the first knockdown on which Corley finally put a knee on the canvas after ducking and ducking. And I think Corley was complaining to the referee that Cotto had hit him while he was down, but I don't think he had the knee all the way down no. at the moment when Cotto hit it. That was a legitimate He's point. still not down there, so Cotto's entitled to swing. That was the first of the two knockdowns. Now here's the second one, which again appeared to be the case of Corley simply taking a knee to avoid further punishment. Just like right there. And when you take a knee to avoid further punishment, you don't expect the referee to stop the fight. No, you don't. So the last thing Corley probably expected here was that the referee would use this as a reason to stop the fight. It's abundantly clear Corley was just looking to regain his equilibrium. But the referee, you know, that's his decision. He may have read it a different way and read it that he was just saying, hey, I'm through. I'm going down this time without even being hit. I mean, I'm, I'm through. I'm done for tonight. Let's go to Michael Buffer for the official particulars on the TKO. Ladies and gentlemen, the end comes at 2 minutes 45 seconds. Round number five, the winner, and still El Invicto Gran Campeón Puerto Riqueño, Miguel Cojo. So once again, just to hammer home the point, Miguel Cotto outdistances what Floyd Mayweather and Zab Judah were able to do against Corley by becoming the first man to knock Corley out, but not before Corley at one point in the fourth round seemed on the verge of knocking Cotto out. Final yeah. copy box numbers, excuse me, that was the third round. Final copy box numbers, total punches, Cotto 117 out of 288. He always has a percentage above or around 40%. And Demarcus Corley, who fought well, 73 out of 346, a lot of good lands with that left cross. And it was interesting also, Cotto was more seriously hurt in the fight than Corley ever was at any one time. Power shots, and you can see that Cotto was one percentage point higher with his connect percentage with the power shots, and Corley landed well, once again, raking Cotto both with right hooks and left crosses. Various situations throughout the fight. Larry stands by now with the winner and still unbeaten, young Miguel Cotto. Thank you, Jim. Congratulations, Miguel. Why was this such a tough fight for you? Primero que nada, quiero mandar un saludo a la unidad 105, Irán Badak. La pelea fue fuerte, un oponente muy fuerte, más fuerte de lo que yo imaginaba. Me dio buenos golpes, pero supimos votarlo, supimos. First of all, I want to say hello to Unit 1065 in Iraq. And the bout was difficult, more difficult than I had planned, but fortunately we were able to uh, get the winning decision. Was it more difficult because you came out so aggressively? And why did you? I think yes, I think we came out aggressive. We came out after the fight very quickly. And then after that first round, which was very good for me, me desespero un poco, pero supimos caer a tiempo. I came out strong and I wanted to be aggressive, but after that first round, uh, we were very positive and we knew what we needed to do and wanted to come out and, and take the game plan. Were you determined to make a big impression by stopping Corley, whom Zab Judah and Floyd Mayweather couldn't? No, no fue así. Creo que fue por por ese primer round que tuve. Tuvo un round muy bueno. En el cual él tuvo un knockdown y, cre y creí que, que si seguía así los, los próximos dos rounds la pelea iba a acabar, pero no fue así, un boxeador bastante experimentado y la pelea pues acabó cuando tenía que acabar. It was because of that first round where I knocked him down and he was shaky and we kept on pressuring him, but he's a solid fighter and we knew it was a long term. Did you sense you were so much stronger as well as bigger than him? No, no, no. Creo que, que colé los golpes claves en los momentos claves, en los lugares claves 
y por eso hicieron el daño que hicieron. No, no, I hit the right shot at the right moment at the right time, and that's why he was hurt. Describe what was going through your mind when your legs turned to spaghetti after he hit you with that right hand on the temple. No, no, me pensé en que ese golpe tenía que votar, no podía, pues, pues defraudar a tantas personas que vinieron aquí, no podía defraudarme yo mismo. Y, y eso hicimos, nos movimos en el momento determinado. It was a hit that I had to forget, but I didn't want to uh, defraud the people that had come here and disillusion the people that had come here and myself, and that's why we were at the end able to win the fight. Have you ever had to deal with that kind of adversity before? ¿Has sentido alguna vez ese tipo de adversidad antes? No, no, no. Fue la primera vez que me que me cuelan dos golpes así en el mismo asalto y y mi 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 respeto me quito el sombrero antes de Marcus Cole. It's the first time that they've hit me twice with some good solid shot in one in one round, and I respect uh, Corley and I salute him. In some way, do you think that will prepare you for the supposedly bigger, tougher fighters in the future? Bueno, entiendo que sí, entiendo que estoy ready para cualquier oponente. Lo que hay que entrenar para ellos. Y cuando la empresa y mi grupo digan, contra ellos pelearemos. I'm ready for any rival, and we just have to train hard. And whenever the company tells me and my trainers tell me, we'll go for it. Thank you very much. Congratulations again, Miguel. And now let me talk to uh, Chop Chop Corley. All right. First, talk to us about the end of the fight. It looked like he was sort of starting to cave you in a bit, and you were a little exhausted. But did you believe that the fight had to be stopped? And take a look at it, Chop Chop, and describe. Well, you see, I went back. He missed a punch. He missed another punch. He missed that. He bad punch hit my shoulder, and I went down on a knee. He didn't even hit me. The ref just stopped the fight premature. If he wanted to stop the fight, Larry, he could have stopped it when I had him hurt. But first of all, I want to thank HBO. I want to thank Todd and them for inviting me back to fight on HBO once again. I want to thank my promoter, Don King right, but that, and Bob Byrne. From what you just showed us, I mean, I don't, why did you go down if he didn't hit you? I was rolling from a punch. And if you're in danger, you're supposed to take a knee if you feel yourself in danger. All right, so you deliberately took a knee because exactly. you wanted to get out of danger. I'm a smart fighter. If I'm in danger, I'm going to take a knee and get myself together. When you hurt him with that right hook in the third round and you saw his legs wobble, yeah. and there was over two minutes left in the round, what was your plan of attack? Uh, to uh, attack him and break him down to the body some, go to the body. And, and bring it back up to the head. Did you miss an opportunity to knock him out, or was he just too strong? No, I missed the opportunity to knock him out. He wasn't too strong for me. I had him hurt, and um, the ref could have stopped the fight when I had him wobbling on bending legs. I mean, but God was here tonight. He seen both fighters in the ring, and he protected both of us. You've been in the ring with Mayweather, with Judah, and now with Cotto. Give us a kind of an assessment. I mean, Todd said we're going to get a rematch, so uh, hopefully we look forward to that. Top rank just um, put me on their card. Thank Don King for well, working no, with I, them. I want, I want the answer to the question. What was the question? Chop, chop. You've been in the ring with Judah, with Mayweather, and now with Cotto. Give me a kind of an assessment. I mean, I've been in there with the best, and um, you can see, Larry, that um, I'm one of the top fighters out here right now. I mean, I weighed in at 137 pounds, came in at 140 tonight. And I can fight at well, genuine Welch weight or even 135 pounds. Okay, that's your assessment of you. Give us your assessment of those three guys, if you I mean, don't mind. I mean, they're some great fighters. I mean, Floyd Mayweather, he proved his point. He's the best at 35. He moved up to 140. He's trying to ring. Is this kid in their class? No, he's not on their level yet. He's not on Zab level. He's not on Mayweather level. Thank you very much. Thank Good. you. Thank Ter HBO. Good fight. Thanks, Larry. Jim? All right. Thanks very much, Larry Merchant. Larry will be down here for his final comments in a minute. Uh, Corley says that that uh, Cotto is not on the level with Mayweather and Judah at this moment. Does he really mean that? Is he saying that because he's disappointed at the way the fight was stopped? Uh, probably a combination. He probably deep down feels that too, but I disagree with him. I think from what I saw tonight, I think that seriously, Cotto has got to be uh, considered as a very big threat with all of the other four or five champions, however you want to call it. I like the fact that he has a good, solid amateur background, which I find very important. He's been fighting very regular. I think his management and promotion company has moved him along perfectly, and he's a serious threat for any of the other top guys up there. 